In our time this morning, we'd like to consider changing the atmosphere. So we want to think for a little while about how important our atmosphere is. And the idea that we're talking about is simply looking at how the atmosphere is that surrounding environment. It's that influence. It also describes the feeling of a place. And so connected with that, we want to think about the kingdom of God. We want to think about the church. We want to think about our congregation. We want to think about changing the atmosphere in our community, changing the atmosphere in our, in our jobs, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our nation, even the world. So think about how we can change the atmosphere in all areas of life, in all areas of the world. We have power because the power comes from God through His Word, through His influence, through His work, through His way. And then it, He works through us as we go out and as we can be those that are going to influence a better atmosphere around us. So as we think about that this morning, let's think about the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat. We're familiar with these things. We use them every day. We understand a thermometer simply reads and reflects the temperature in a room. We might illustrate that by thinking of a meeting. Maybe it's a meeting that we're in at work. Maybe it's school, whatever the situation may be. And we know that as things go along in that room and the atmosphere may be a certain way to where everything is hot regarding there's some really tempers in there. There's some, some maybe not good attitudes going on. People aren't in their best. They're not showing their best. They're not presenting their best. Maybe it's a cooler atmosphere and maybe people are peaceful. Maybe there's unity there. Maybe there's cooperation. Maybe there's a get along with one another attitude. But we know that atmosphere is important. It, it's there and we can gauge it with a thermometer. We can go in and we'll feel that same pressure or that same peace that could be there, whichever one it is. And we know that often people live this way. They live their lives as a thermometer. They go into a situation and it's going to depend on the culture around them. It's going to depend on the day. It's going to depend on whether it's sunny or cloudy. Maybe, maybe the weather's going to affect that. But we can spot this ourselves. We can spot it in ourselves as well that possibly we may be a thermometer, and we're just going to go along with the crowd. If it's hot in there, if, if there's things going on that, that just aren't good, we may be in that crowd. If it's peaceful, if there's unity, if, if it's going in a good way, maybe we'll drift with that as well. But we sometimes find ourselves as just being thermometers. We can spot this if, if we become negative when we're around negative people or we become critical around people that are critical. What about being a thermostat? This is where the temperature is regulated. The thermostat's going to help control the temperature in that room. And so think about as we come into that meeting, maybe we're in that meeting again, and tempers are flaring. There's a lot of tension. There's a lot of stress. Maybe we can come in and be someone peaceful. Maybe we can help that situation and balance that out and bring some, some focus that is in the right way. So we realize that if it's, if it's too hot, we can regulate that down to be cooler. If it's too cool, maybe we can warm it up a little bit. Whatever the need is, we could be a thermostat. But notice with that, there's the idea of being intentional, isn't there? There's a determination there that I'm going to do something a certain way. And so we have to read the room. We have to be a thermometer and read what's the atmosphere in here. But then we need to be a thermostat and help regulate that temperature. Do you set the temperature for the people that you're around? Are you that positive person who can find the good in the midst of trouble? You know, that's always a beacon of light person, isn't it? When, when we see a serious situation, but then there's that individual that can bring a positive spin, can bring a good atmosphere into that situation. Can you influence people to see the good in things? Sometimes we only look at the negative. We only look at the downside. But can we influence people to see the good in things? Are you willing to stand up for what is right even, for, even when it's unpopular? 
If so, you're a thermostat. And so we remember that a thermometer is going to reflect the temperature of the environment. It's more of a reactionary instrument, isn't it? On the other hand, a thermostat is that which is going to try to regulate the environment in an intentional way. We're going to be an influencer. And I think, no doubt, we can see where we need to be. If we think about our lives as Christians, as we think about following the way of God, as we think about patterning our life after Jesus Christ, think of Jesus. And we're going to do that a little bit in our lesson this morning, as well as some other things and passages that will hopefully help us to make sure that we are going to be thermostats. We're going to help regulate. We're going to help set the tone. We're going to help create and mold and refashion that atmosphere in the right way in whatever situation we find ourselves in. In Romans chapter 12, in the first two verses, very familiar statement to us, but one that's so important as we think about our place in life as a child of God. We know up until this chapter in the book of Romans, Paul is very heavy into teachings about Jesus and the cross and the purpose of Jesus coming, and he's talking a lot about sin and about grace and about righteousness. But when he gets to chapter 12, this section that we have in Romans 12, it's very practical. It's stuff that we are to take and put into practice in our daily lives. It's not something to just read over and say, well, that was nice, but it's something that he says, I want you to practice these things. And if you'll notice as we look at some things here in Romans 12 this morning, these are things that are going to help set the thermostat into the right atmosphere. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The Christian's life is a life of sacrifice to God. We should recognize immediately when we obey the gospel, the Lord now is going to own all of us. Heart, body, soul, mind, and might, everything about us Every part of our being, of who we are and what we're about, we have given over to God for His use. And so if we remember by being thermostats instead of thermometers, we're going to set the standard instead of adjusting to the standard. We're going to be those that are going to influence for the way God wants people to live and how He wants people to conduct themselves. In verses 3 through 8 here in Romans 12, notice that there's some points here that are made to remind us that we need to evaluate our gifts, what God has given into our hand to be responsible for, certain practices, certain obligations, certain opportunities that He will place there, certain things He's given each of us that we can do. And He says, think about those things, and that's especially in verse 3. In verses 4 and 5 here, He wants us to remember that we're part of a team. He says, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. And so he reminds us to remember we're on the same team. We've all been given individual gifts and abilities and responsibilities, but he says, use those and work together in unity and in love and in truth to fulfill God's will. And so we reflect on what he's given us. We remember that we're on a team. We're in the same boat. We're saved by the same blood. And then in verses 6 through 8, he reminds us to respond and use our abilities for him. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And notice how he mentions several different things. A couple of them pertain to the first century, prophecy in proportion to our faith. Now we have the completed word. But he says, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Read, as we read those points, 
That's telling us you can change the atmosphere. Not only among you as Christians in your congregation, but on the job, in our schools, in our homes, in our communities, in our cities, towns, state, country, world. Think about that. There's no limit to the application. As we live our lives and we use the gifts, the blessings God has given, and we praise Him with those and we fulfill His will in being faithful to use what He's given us. Then in verses 9 through uh, the rest of the chapter, really, and we're not going to look at all of these, but again, with this thought in mind this morning of how we need to be thermostats, and God calls upon us, don't just be blowing with the wind and be a thermometer of whatever it is out there already, but I want you to set the standard. You be the person of change to do God's will and bring about God's purpose. And so we begin reading there in verse 9 of Romans 12. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. As Christians, we're going to literally hate away anything evil. And we're only going to want what is good for one another. Each of these statements can be taken and broken down, and there's so much in them. We don't even have time this morning to begin that. But just think about how these apply to us changing the atmosphere. Connected with that in Psalm 119 and 104, the Bible says, Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. We're going to have to hate evil, hate ungodliness. Why? Because God does. It's against his nature. He has no fellowship with that. And he calls upon us to separate ourselves from sin, from ungodliness, from evil. He says, cling. Literally, Christians glue themselves to that which is best for each other. The reading a few moments ago in Philippians 4 reminds us of that. And we'll notice that again in a few moments. In Galatians 6 and verse 10, so then as you have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. In verse 10, notice in Romans 12, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. And notice how the rest of the chapter reminds us then of how to deal with those who are against us and how we can sow seed, how we can change the atmosphere, even with those that are against us, those that hate us, those that are trying to stop us in our Christian walk. And so there's so much here in Romans 12 that is practical that we can apply every day of our lives. So we give preference, we're to be fervent, we're to serve, we're to rejoice, we're to weep with those who weep, we're to continue to serve and be steadfast in prayer, be watchful. Notice all of these words and how important they are, even given to hospitality. You know, as we think about all these things and we think about our Lord, we think about how Jesus was one who changed the atmosphere. He was a thermostat. We should desire to be like him. He was a major pace setter, wasn't he? He was a total leader, and he expects us to be the same. We look at his life, and, and we notice here in Hebrews chapter 12 in the first two verses how we need to stay focused. We need to have our eyes, our minds, our lives fixed on Jesus. Therefore, since we also have a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with patience or endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Earlier, we talked in Romans 12 in the first two verses of being transformed. 
not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind and molding ourselves to the life of Jesus and to his mind and to his way and to his thinking and to his practices. And so the writer here says, keep our eyes on Jesus. If we're going to change the atmosphere, that's the only way we can do it, keeping our eyes on Jesus. We can't look at self. We can't look at someone else. We have to look at Christ because he is the one who has changed the atmosphere in the whole world historically in every way. The gospel turned the world upside down. We can still do that today. We can still change the atmosphere and help as the gospel goes forth. Scripture there that was read in such an excellent way earlier in Philippians 4, Jesus wants us to have a focus. He says you can't change the atmosphere unless you're focused on him and on the things that he knows that are going to be successful, the things that are true, the things that are honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, he says, think about these things. We go into a meeting, we go into a situation, this is how we need to be armed. This is going to change the atmosphere. He says, what you have learned and received, Paul did and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And what's the result, Paul? The God of peace will be with you. We know it's essential to focus upon our Lord. It's essential to be a faithful child of God in any situation in life. Sometimes people have the limited view that they're only to be a Christian when we gather together today or tonight or maybe Wednesday night and they fail to take this and apply changing the atmosphere to their job and so they go to their job and they're a thermometer on Monday. And whatever the job or the boss demands, even if it's unethical or sinful or ungodly or immoral, hey, it's the job. This is, this is my work. But Jesus says, no, you're to always be changing the atmosphere with your life. You're always to be a Christian, not just on Sunday or Wednesday or when the brethren are together. He says, every moment of your life, every compartment at school, in our home, in our neighborhood, with our friends, all of our associations, whatever we're involved in. He says, we need to change the atmosphere. Don't be a thermometer. Be a thermostat and help initiate the change of God, of Christ, of godly things. Our mind needs to be on many things. Among those, God the psalmist said to you, I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Our minds should be on Jesus. He said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. John 8 and verse 23. Our mind needs to be upon the church, to the assembly of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, Hebrews 12. And verse 23 should be on the Word of God as well, Psalm 119 and 127. So many other things could be listed there. Why are these things important? Because our citizenship is in heaven. And this morning we want to end with a great example in Acts chapter 16 of a record we have of two great individuals who set just a, an amazing example before us of how they were thermostats and not thermometers. We're all familiar with Paul and Silas being imprisoned in Acts 16. We realize and understand that they were there not because of anything they had done wrong. They were simply doing the Lord's will. They were preaching the gospel. They were spreading the word of God. And we know how that goes against the grain of the world. And often as we read through the Bible, it goes against the view of the leaders, those that are in power, and it makes them mad, it makes them angry. And so they want to throw the disciples into prison. They want to beat them, punish them, try to silence them, tell them that you can't speak another word in the name of Christ. But Paul and Silas were faithful. Now they find themselves in the stocks. They find themselves down in the inner prison. And they'd been tortured. Their backs were raw. Their bodies wrecked in pain. 
They were chained, locked away. They did nothing wrong. Just think about how easy it would be, it would have been in their situation, to have been a thermometer and sat there and just moan and groan over, look at what, what's happened to us. Look at, we're trying to do the Lord's will and this is the, the pay we get. This is the respect that we get. It's hard for us sometimes to put ourselves in their shoes, but think about that. Think about how they had been treated for doing what is right, for doing godly things. But many would look at that and say, you know, this is just not right. This is not fair. And we would complain and we would moan and groan. And we know what they were doing. I guess if anyone had an opportunity to complain, it would have been Paul and Silas. But about midnight, in verse 25, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Can you imagine the prisoners thinking, they're, they're probably talking in thermometer talk, right? Boy, if I was those guys, I would be so angry. I'd be just coming out of there so mad and, and cursing God and cursing these, these leaders. Paul and Silas changed the atmosphere, didn't they? What else can be said? That's powerful. That's some of the most powerful stuff in the Bible. They were changing the atmosphere. They weren't being thermometers. They were being thermostats. And they were found praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. They were being influenced. Apply that to your life. Apply, I'll apply that to my life. How do we live our daily life? Are we thermometers or are we thermostats? Is there any improvement we need to make? Do I need to make any changes tomorrow morning for the week when I'm around work associates, family, friends, other people that we come in contact with? Shouldn't we be found like Paul and Silas no matter what happens? Shouldn't we be thanking God? Shouldn't we be praising God for His blessings? This world's messed up, as we know. It's corrupt. There are bad things that happen all the time. But we have a way out, don't we? Through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Paul and Silas knew that. They knew this world is not our home. We have a greater home awaiting us. In the heavens, in, in our heavenly home, God has prepared. Jesus has gone on to prepare a way, a place for us. So they started singing praises to God. What a blessing they were to those that heard them. You and I can be a blessing to those around us, and we need to remember to give people grace. We need to cut people some slack. We need to have gratitude in our hearts. We need to put in more compliments than complaints. And we need to be generous. We need to give all of ourselves, all of our abilities, all of our resources to the glory of God. Are you going to be one who's going to go out this week and the rest of your life and be a thermostat, change the atmosphere, be a person who's going to change in a positive way? Or are we going to remain a thermometer? Maybe that's what we've been doing. Maybe that's all we know, and we've not tried to change. But we know we need to change. We have to change. To be like Jesus wants us to be, fixing our eyes upon Him. This morning, if you're not a child of God, won't you make that beginning step this morning by responding in faith, repenting of your sins, and we'll immerse you into Jesus for the remission of your sins. The blood of Jesus Christ is what forgives you. It's what washes away your sins. And then we go on living a life of faith, dedication and service, being those that change the atmosphere. Maybe you've already done that. Maybe you've found that in your life you've been more of a thermometer than a thermostat. You know you need to change. God gives us that opportunity to repent of our sins and pray to Him, and He'll forgive us and give us a brand new start. Won't you do that today as we stand and sing?